The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, two museum openings, M Plus in Hong Kong and the renovated Courtauld Gallery in London. Also, we look at black American portraits in Los Angeles. In Hong Kong, the long-awaited M Plus Museum opens this week amid accusations of censorship by the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. Ilaria Maria Sala joins us to talk about her visit to the museum. The Courtauld Gallery, one of London's great collections, is also reopening after a three-year renovation, and I take a tour of the gallery with its director, Ernst Fegelin van Kleerbergen. And in this week's Work of the Week, Christine Y. Kim tells us about Samela Lewis's Bagman, a key work in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art's exhibition, Black American Portraits. Before all that, a reminder that you can sign up to the Art Newspaper's free daily newsletter for all the latest stories. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top left of the page. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. And if you like what we do, please give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Now, the M Plus Museum is billed as Asia's first global museum of contemporary visual culture, based in the West Kowloon Cultural District of Hong Kong, and it finally opens this week after delays, changes in leadership, spiralling costs, and now accusations of censorship from the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. He said that the museum has decided to exclude a number of his photographs from its opening exhibition. The work in question, Study of Perspective, features one image in which Ai gives the middle finger to Beijing's Tiananmen Square. Our reporter, Ilaria Maria Sala, went to the opening of the museum and I spoke to her about it. Ilaria, is it fair to say that M Plus as a museum is in a very different context to the one it was conceived in all those years ago? Well, what would be even fairer to say is that Hong Kong is in a very different situation than the kind of Hong Kong it was when the museum had been conceived. So, of course, there are more issues related to the museum itself right now, but there are also more issues related to freedom of expression, freedom of speech, all around Hong Kong. So it's not just the museum, but it's the whole situation that has changed quite dramatically. Of course, the... the, the... National security law is the cause of that. And one of the things that I'm, I'm aware of acutely is that here in Western Europe and in the States, perhaps, the reporting around M plus suggests that it's a museum in a certain amount of crisis because of this. But what's the perception there? You're in Hong Kong. What, what, what's being said about it there? No, that is not the perception that uh, there is in Hong Kong and especially is not at all the perception that there was at the museum today at the opening. And this is for a number of reasons. So one very clear reason, I think, is because once we have seen today what the exhibits are, we can see that even if maybe certain things are presented in a more subtle way than they might have been before, there is a lot there that shows that the curators have really navigated um, with a great amount of awareness the new situation and the need to display certain works. This is particularly evident with the Chinese collection that was partially donated and partially acquired by M+. Uh, and this is the Uli Sig collection, which is a collection of works of uh, contemporary Chinese art. And uh, some of the works, especially from the 80s and the 90s, are overtly political and they face very clearly some of the big taboos, let's say, that there are in uh, mainland China, so just across the border. So definitely, I would say, no sense of crisis as such. On the contrary, Um, the museum took quite a while to open. There have been a number of delays. And so the atmosphere was actually the opposite. It was an atmosphere of uh, more of festivity, in a sense, that finally the museum is here and Hong Kong can start to interact with it. 
Indeed. So, so let, let's talk about, I mean, um, Ai Weiwei is obviously, you know, he's the most famous Chinese artist, certainly in, again, Western Europe and North America, etc. And his criticisms of the museum have very been very strong because of re- relating to a particular image, which is he, one of his sequence of images where he's um, sort of raising a middle finger to various monuments throughout the world. And he did it to Tiananmen Square. Yeah. And he says that it's been censored from the museum and indeed from the museum's website. What's the actual situation there? So, of course, this image and uh, the controversy surrounding it was quite present on everyone's mind. So that was one of the main questions during the initial press conference, where we had some remarks by Henry Tang, who is the the head of M+, let's say more on an official position. He's not a curator, he's a, a Hong Kong politician. And... Um, He was asked about Ai Weiwei, in particular about that image that we are talking about. And uh, in a sense, he didn't really give a very straightforward reply. What he was saying is that societies change, and so certain types of art might be appropriate or not appropriate as society change. And he was in particular referring to works that may have seemed fine last century, early last century, and today we would call racist, and so the Tate wouldn't show them. So he was really kind of trying to change the topic to some extent, because that didn't seem to be a very pertinent answer, because this is not a question of society having changed, but politics having changed, which is quite a difference. And uh, having said that, he also added that this image in particular is part of a set, And uh, it was probably better to show the whole thing. So again, he was sort of trying to avoid the question. Yeah, yeah, somewhat fudging his answer, you would say. Indeed, indeed. That said, there are two works by Ai Weiwei, which are in the main gallery. Uh, So it's not like the entirety of Ai Weiwei is not present. There is quite a large installation called Whitewashing, which is a series of um, ancient anfers from Bampo, which are these very, um, these Neolithic era anfers, and some of them have been whitewashed. Of course, it's not as in your face, it's not as politically direct as the finger. But um, at the same time, I think the fact that Ai Weiwei is included is positive, is is at least a sign that the curators have been trying to navigate this line and not caved in entirely to, let's say, self-censorship or whitewashing, to use the title of the of the piece by Ai Weiwei, what actually is in the collection. The other thing that was said, which can be both positive and negative according to what will happen, is that um, Henry Tang said that uh, some works may be shown later on or not, meaning that, of course, the museum will have certain works that will be rotating because there's, um, again, in the Yuli Sig collection, for example, there's many more works than what can fit into the space available currently. And uh, does it mean that then there will be again, a political scrutiny on what can be shown in the future or not. That is anyone's guess, really. Yeah, that's interesting, that, isn't it? Because I've seen other statements by Tang where he seemed to suggest, or indeed the museum has seemed to suggest, that there is some form of approval process through which things like the websites and what appears on the websites do have to go through in order to enter into the world beyond. Is that is that your sense that fundamentally there are sort of some forms of checks and balances that are that the Chinese that sorry that the Hong Kong government is exercising in terms of the content on on M Plus's website? Well, there might be a lack of transparency in some of these processes that make this quite a difficult question to answer. Maybe yes, maybe no. There's a lot that feels a bit not said. And uh, because of that, unless you have a way to really understand what is being done on the official level. And again, I would like to stress the difference between the curatorial side and uh, the more official level, which is mostly, um, well, as I don't know if our listeners know, but it's a public museum. So the government 
does have a connection with the museum, at least in terms of funding, and uh, in other senses, in many other senses as well. So, is there something happening at the website level? We don't really know. Um, one thing that I think was interesting and uh, um, slightly surprising to me, at least, was that, for example, uh, again in the um, Uli Sik collection, we have on show some fairly strong pieces. In particular, I'm thinking about Water but by Zhang Pei Li, which is a video installation that was produced after 89 and uh, it's a very subtle piece of work which has the newscaster who announced the military occupation of Tiananmen Square in 89 reading aloud from a dictionary entries about water in this kind of perfect diction that um, a, a TV presenter in China would have. And, and this piece is on show and it's on show today. So at the most, let's say, the most visible day of M+. And uh, that is probably even stronger as a statement than uh, Ai Weiwei with the finger. Another really important work that was present today is Wan Sing Wei, and it's a big oil painting called New Beijing, which has... Uh, it's elaborated from a photo, from a press photo from 89, from the massacre in 89 in Beijing. And uh, it has, there's one man pedaling on a tricycle, um, one of those kind of chariot tricycles. And uh, there's men around running, holding two bodies on the back, on the plank of the tricycle. But instead of being wounded demonstrators they are two penguins and so uh, this work is uh, not really subtle in this case because it's so striking and it's so large and this also was there now there's a difference though if we think back to 2016 when uh, the Ulysses collection was first presented in Hong Kong and that is not in what is on display but is on the captions so the captions are much vaguer. What was, for example, for water, for the, the video installation by Jan Pei Li, it would say very clearly what that was and it would make a detailed connection with the fact that the TV presenter was the same one that had uh, announced that the army had come to Tiananmen Square. And uh, in this case, it wasn't. It didn't say it. It just said, we have this, uh, this is by Jan Peli, it's called Water, and she is reading entries from a dictionary. So it requires a bit of previous knowledge of the work. And what is interesting is also that this was changed, in a sense, that this has been, it, it maybe it was safer in 2016 to say this. And the caption leaves a, a bit more for personal research to find out exactly what this presenter is doing there that's interesting I mean, and that's the museum enacting its own form of kind of self-censorship right well you see i hesitate a bit in calling this self-censorship because what we see here is a level of censorship that is not really the museum's own idea so i would call it more a way of navigating changed circumstances while precisely not engaging in self-censorship because the piece is still there. And so maybe by fudging the caption a little is what allows the piece to be still there. But the fact that the caption has to be fudged a little bit might be more censorship than self-censorship. That might be more, um, let's say, the responsibility of those authorities that have changed the atmosphere in Hong Kong to the point that the same caption cannot really be carried over from 2016 to 2021. That's interesting. Um, th th tell me about the museum. It's obviously an, an enormous space. It's by Herzog and de Merle, who are, you know, the, uh, the preeminent architects for museums across the world, really, these days. And, and tell me about that space, because it looks ex extraordinary. It is. It really is. November is one of the best seasons in Hong Kong with a really crisp light. And uh, today it was just perfect because um, there's very many large windows with a kind of 
looks like bamboo, but it's uh, ceramics lines on the facade. And uh, so what we have, I don't know if you have seen from the outside what it looks like is like a large screen, which is a LED screen that also projects um, a number of different images. And then there is a sort of squat square base on which the screen, which is also where the offices are. Uh, so the squat base, it's a square and it's extremely large and extremely beautiful. And uh, those are the two levels on which the galleries are. And uh, there is a fantastic use of both natural light and artificial light, which is actually distributed in a way that makes it extremely similar to natural light. And on the ground floor, it opens directly onto the sea. So again, the views are, are really quite spectacular. But um, in terms of architecture, it's really world class and it, it's really very, very beautiful. And is there a sort of strong public appetite for a public museum of this kind and particularly focused on modern and contemporary art? Definitely, yes. Not only because of the long wait that there has been for the museum to actually open, and that has certainly created a stronger desire and anticipation for this. And uh, so the museum is free of charge for the full first year. But in order to control crowds, people need to book online a, a time slot. And from what I understand, all of November is already fully booked. So there's huge appetite. And uh, at the same time, there's also a huge interest. So this is a museum of modern contemporary art, of course, but it's also a museum of um, visual culture, as it's called. And so there is a whole section in the Hong Kong section. There is a lot of uh, pop culture and uh, for example there's a, there's a whole part on uh, some other important buildings in the city with uh, the first architectural drawings and uh, part of the local vernacular in terms of architecture which is very well displayed in the museum but also there are for example some uh, former government campaigns in particular uh, Lap Sap Chong who was the uh, litter bug of Hong Kong was a, a, a public campaign that was launched by the government in the 70s and has this uh, mascot, which is the little bag Lap Sap Chong, who is uh, actually extremely cute. And he was he was meant to be seen as some kind of half dinosaur with big red spots. It's a it's a red um, lizard or dinosaur or whatever. And uh, it has a red band over his eyes like a like a bandit. And uh, it became extremely popular among children and so and also among adults. And so there is all this section on him, which is both recalling a vernacular culture and a, a, a very local Hong Kong characteristic and uh, paying homage, of course, to, in this case, it was colonial designers and those who had programmed the, the public campaign. And... Uh, in a sense, there is a part of the exhibits from the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, which are playing in public consciousness, let's say, quite strongly with the wave of nostalgia that we have in Hong Kong at the moment. So that makes it even more of a very, a very strongly felt museum because it has all these uh, uh, memories of uh, growing up in housing estates, of uh, Lap Sap Chong, for example, or uh, pop stars from the 80s, like Anita Mui. And um, in that sense, what I'm, what I'm feeling around me is also a strong, a strong sense of connection with the museum because it talks about this uh, Hong Kong past. And uh, of course, what we are seeing now that the political situation has become uh, more fraught is uh, a bit of an idealization maybe of the 90s or the 80s but uh, the fact that there can be this uh, um, th there is the possibility of seeing in a in a curated show this time which is a bit mythicized is um, 
I, I think it's a sure winner for uh, for the public. And other than, than being extremely interesting in terms of the visual culture. That's really interesting. So are you effectively saying that this wave of nostalgia directly connects to the political changes? Yes, a bit. And also nostalgia is a feeling that is very Hong Kong, maybe because the city changes so fast and uh, it's been changing so fast for decades. Of course, it's a nostalgia that has been increasing now with the political changes that we are facing at present, but uh, it's not a, f- a sentiment that was absent before. Also partially because, as you know, Hong Kong has uh, so much wealth invested in real estate and there is this constant destroying of older buildings and building up newer buildings. And so there is a constant sense of losing something that was uh, familiar, that was uh, part of one's uh, landscape. And so nostalgia is a bit ingrained in uh, Hong Kong itself. And now that the changes have gotten faster and they are not just affecting the buildings, but also the, the structure of society and the, the values of society, it's become even more prominent. And in this sense, the museum offers a bit of a balm, a bit of a, a space in which that nostalgia can be, in a way, part of a more material aspect of being able to see it directly and being able to, um, to have very concrete objects in front of which certain memories can be uh, can come up again in a more precise way. Elaria, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. M Plus is open now. You can hear the artist Casey Wong's interview on this podcast about the impact of the national security law on artists on the episode called Hong Kong Has the New Law Destroyed the Art Scene from July 2020. Coming up, we take a tour of the Courtauld Gallery and we hear about Samela Lewis at LACMA. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. The UK's main national museums have all recently published their financial accounts for 2020 to 21, which make sober reading. All suffered disastrous falls in visitor numbers because of COVID-19, being closed for over half the year and only being able to have small numbers when they reopened. The Tate welcomed only 7% of its normal visitors, the National Gallery had 4% and the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum just 3%. In his report, Martin Bailey examines the financial implications of the pandemic on Tate, a museum group that in the past few years has proved remarkable successful in raising self-generated funding. In order to begin what it dubs as the process of decolonisation, the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria, British Columbia, announced on the 3rd of November that it would be closing its third floor gallery spaces. As Dorian Bachka reports, in a statement posted to the museum's website, Acting Chief Executive Daniel Muzica said that the changes were long overdue. As part of our work to implement modernised museum practices, in particular our efforts around decolonisation, we will be closing the third floor so we can decant our galleries, Muzica said. This is necessary to begin the long-term work of creating new narratives that include underrepresented voices and reflect the lived experiences and contemporary stories of the people in British Columbia. And finally, the director of exhibitions at Tate Modern, Akim Borchardt Hume, has died aged 55. Akim appeared on this podcast, taking me on a tour of Picasso 1932, just one of a host of brilliantly researched and presented exhibitions he curated at the Tate, the Whitechapel Galleries and the Serpentine Gallery. You can read Akim's obituary by the former director of Tate, Nicholas Sarota, at theartnewspaper.com or on our iOS or Android apps. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This November, discover live and online auctions at Christie's in Milan and Amsterdam dedicated to modern and contemporary masterworks, part of Christie's 20th, 21st century season. Kicking off in Milan with evening and online sales, the season showcases photographs, prints and multiples from Italian and international artists, including Enrico Castellani, Alighiero Boetti, Piero Dorazio, David LaChapelle, David Bowie and Salvo. 
In Amsterdam, the exceptional single owner auction, A Thousand Roads, a private collection in Rome, presents works from renowned artists such as Francis Picabia, Alexander Calder and more. 20th, 21st century Amsterdam closes the season with names such as Martin Kippenberger, Sam Francis, Arnulf Reiner and Daniel Richter, as well as works from two important European collections. Find out more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, the Courtauld Gallery, the museum attached to the Courtauld Institute, one of the great international centres for the study of art history, is reopening to the public after a three-year closure. One of those remarkable institutions built from a belief that enjoying and understanding art improves society, the Courtauld is best known for the founding Impressionist and Post-Impressionist collection of the textile magnate Samuel Courtauld and his wife Elizabeth. But it was later joined by other collections that added major works by Cranach, Botticelli, Rubens and a host of others. Though much loved in London, the old Courtauld Gallery didn't really show art in the best way, but now, after a beautiful and sensitive renovation by Witherford Watson Mann Architects, it's reopening, with spaces repurposed and opened up, new rooms created, a new commission from the painter Cecily Brown, and a series of displays which bring fresh light to its magnificent collection. I went to the gallery to take a tour with its director, Ernst Wegelin van Kleerbergen. Ernst, we're in the earliest part of the collection here. And this is, a, in a way, a kind of problematic part of the collection because it used to be kind of hidden away, right? That's right. I mean, it's, uh, it's a wonderful part of the collection, and that was the, the challenge, really, to bring it back to prominence. It used to be displayed in a single gallery on the ground floor, and what tended to happen was that people walked straight past it, drawn by the, uh, the great Impressionists on the second floor, uh, and so what we wanted to do was really to create a situation where people could uh, really for the first time enjoy and encounter these pictures in a very sort of high quality setting. This is really one of the most important collections of early Netherlandish and early Italian paintings in the UK. Indeed. And I'm going to focus on this amazing work attributed to Robert Compin. It's a triptych. It's an altarpiece. Tell us about it. Uh, one of my very favourite pictures in the collection, Full Stop, painted by Robert Campin, we believe, who was a contemporary of uh, Jan van Eyck, um, worked in Tournai. It's an absolutely extraordinary sort of miraculous uh, survival across you know, more than 500 years. Uh, it's relatively small scale, probably used for private devotion in the home rather than on, uh, on, on a church altar. In the center panel, we see uh, Christ lowered into the tomb after his crucifixion. Uh, on the right-hand side is his resurrection with a group of very exotically sort of uh, dressed uh, soldiers sleeping uh, at his feet as he rises out of the tomb and an angel sitting on the lid of the tomb that has moved aside and on the left hand side is the donor who sits next to his, his little white dog rather touchingly at the head of a path that winds through the landscape in which uh, we also see the three crosses uh, of the crucifixion. He remains unidentified rather intriguingly and uh, coming out of his mouth is a white scroll on which one imagines uh, originally there were the first words of a prayer um, a prayer which is sort of enab enabling him to visualize this extraordinary scene and that serpentine shape of, of this, this scroll, it's echoed all the way through the composition in the path that you talk about, but also in this fence that, that creeps from the right-hand panel into the central panel, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. That's really, really wonderful, that sort of unity in a sense. And how perplexing it is, I think, for a modern audience to think that this man can... Um, have himself depicted in this sacred landscape. But of course, this is in a sense a projection of his devotional imagination. And uh, the painter using oil paint, uh, a very early example of the use of oil paint, has achieved, I think, in this work just an, a clarity of design and an intensity of emotional expression, which really is heartbreaking. Of course, one of the great things about it is that, it, it, you know, you've mentioned about that sort of level of emotion, but the level of detail is, is so extraordinary in, in the way that that emotion is depicted. So you have, you know, the Virgin, who is obviously closest to Christ, but then the angels are expressing their emotions so, so powerfully, aren't they? 
Yes, that's really very touching. The virgin who bends herself over uh, the prostrate figure of her son and then the angels who are holding the instruments of the passion, the crown of thorns, the spear, the, the sponge and the nails um, are equally sort of uh, emotionally engaged, particularly the one holding the sponge who has this very uh, touching and human expression as she wipes a tear off his or her cheek. And the, the use of oil paint has enabled the, the artist really to achieve that uh, extraordinary detail throughout the painting, including the, the flowers and the foliage, the front of the painting at the beginnings of the tomb. And there is one particular flower there or plant which is cast really in relief and stands above the others uh, and is offset against the marble uh, of the tomb. That I think could perhaps give us a clue into the identity of the donor. Could that be some sort of a heraldic device or a, a something mm. of that nature? How intriguing. Now, in this gallery, you've also got decorative arts, and this is a really important part because all the way through, as, as we'll hear, mm. that you've got the famous paintings, but there are objects all around them and smaller works, for instance, that just sort of punctuate the galleries, right? Yes. Yes, the spine of the displays is a great paintings collection from the late medieval, early Renaissance to the 1950s, um, but we wanted to enrich the displays wherever possible with works from our decorative arts collection, which is a very strong part of the collection, not very well known. So in this particular gallery, we've got alongside Italian and Netherlandish gold ground paintings, we have a wonderful group of Gothic ivories from, uh, from Paris, um, and then also contemporary uh, Islamic metalwork, which I think people will be just delighted to discover in this context. And it enables one to make some really beautiful connections, looking at a portable triptych by Bernardo Daddy made in 1338 and then very closely sort of comparable to a triptych in ivory form made in Paris uh, at exactly the same time and the same subject matter. Great, let's move on to the next gallery now. Okay. We're with A Great Trinity by Botticelli, Ernst, and, and this has always struck me as a very strange picture, but it looks better than ever. Oh, I'm really glad you say that. We've spent three years making sure that it does look better than ever. Uh, it was a really neglected masterpiece in the collection, a really important part of our Renaissance holdings, but over time had, um, had become sort of... Uh, in a sense, lost amongst the other pictures, uh, principally because of its severely compromised condition. The panel had started to crack into three separate parts. The varnish layer was very yellow and obscured the, uh, the painting below. There was quite a lot of overpaint which had become discolored. And so during our closure period, we took the opportunity to undertake a really major uh, and far-reaching program of conservation to bring this picture back to its sort of wonderful condition. One of the strangest things about this picture is the sense of scale because you have Mary Magdalene and St John the Baptist and the, and the crucified Christ and then you have these tiny figures comparatively at the bottom of the picture and tell me about those. So yes, it's perhaps hard for visitors now to understand that this picture isn't a single sort of a unified narrative and, and composition. What we're really looking at is Mary Magdalene, who through her sort of devotional imagination is visualizing this scene of uh, Christ on the cross held up by uh, God the Father behind. And it sort of hovers over this barren, rocky landscape in which Mary Magdalene stands together with John the Baptist. Uh, and then walking through that landscape, much smaller scale, as you said, are Tobias and the angel, absolutely beautifully painted, autographed Botticelli, one of the most exquisite parts of the, uh, of the whole altarpiece. And that relates to a legend that they're, they're holding a little fish, I should have pointed yes, out. Yes, yeah, very delicately uh, painted fish. Yeah. Yes, that Tobias, uh, with the help of an angel, uh, was able to, uh, to catch a fish to cure the blindness of his, uh, of his father. They're still, their presence in the picture is still partly unexplained and might relate to who uh, funded the commission originally. And then, of course... 
the Magdalene's robe is made entirely of hair, and it's so, again, extraordinary, so strange. That's right. I mean, you can see the detail of that now much more clearly since uh, the picture was conserved, and you can actually make out around her waist that her hair is sort of bound up into a, into a belt that's holding this great sort of mat together. She's clearly the crucial person in the picture other than uh, Christ, and that has to do with its original setting. The painting was commissioned for a Florentine uh, convent church called Santa Elisabetta delle Convertite. That convent had a very particular uh, role in that it cared for what one can perhaps describe as penitent prostitutes. And so this original audience in the church would have been invited to regard Mary Magdalene as their exemplar and prototype uh, in the way that she is able to, um, to, to, to visualize and consider Christ. And again, in sight of this picture, you've got some wonderful maiolica, and again, we've got some, some Middle Eastern metalwork. So it's, again, you're, you're wanting to mix up the collection. Yes, that's right. I think to create sort of variety and points of interest and to make connections between uh, works, and perhaps the other highlight in the gallery um, is the pair of, uh, of extraordinary wedding chess made in 1472, so about 20 years before the Botticelli, the Morelli Neri wedding chests, the only surviving examples of their kind where the wedding chests are still paired with their original painted backboards or spalieri. And these things are fully documented in the archives in Florence, so we know exactly when they were made, why they were made, who was paid, how much for doing which parts, and so I mean, fantastic things to, uh, to have in this opening display. Indeed they are. This might be a good moment to talk about the sort of way that the Courtauld collection has been built up, because, of course, Samuel Courtauld is the most famous person yes. who's behind this collection, but it's made up of lots of collections. Yes, that's right. I and mean, we do add to the collection. We do occasionally buy things, not at the level, unfortunately, of, uh, of, of Botticelli and, uh, and Robert Carpat, but the collection is growing and developing. But historically, it's grown almost entirely through gifts and bequests by some of the great collectors uh, in this country in the 20th century. Samuel Courtauld and his extraordinary impressionist masterpieces, Count Antoine Zeilen, who was an Austrian-British collector of all master paintings and drawings, a great collector of Rubens, Viscount Lee of Fareham, who was also the person who gave uh, checkers to, uh, to the nation for use by the Prime Minister. Uh, and actually, it was, it was uh, Lord Lee who gave us both the wedding chests and the Botticelli uh, altarpiece. He claims to have found the Botticelli in the basement of a frame dealer's shop in Piccadilly and writes in his memoirs that it was a little bit dirty, but he thought it was a good picture. And he took it home and just washed it down with a bit of soap and water, and it looked, uh, it looked great. So we, we took a different approach in our, uh, in our treatment this time around. That's great. Uh, you mentioned Rubens there. Let's go and look at some yeah. Rubens. Now, we're in front of... Uh, there's, there's very many Rubens in, in these displays, but we're in front of two pictures which show the, a very different character of this great artist. Let's talk first about Rubens' portrait of the family of Jan Bruegel the Elder. Yes, this is a wonderful picture and a very interesting way uh, for people to approach Rubens, who I think some people struggle with nowadays, but he's the most extraordinary and sort of rewarding artist, and an, I think an extremely sort of appealing uh, personality. This is a portrait of family and friendship. It shows um, Jan Bruegel the Elder, who was the son of the famous painter Peter Bruegel the Elder. Jan Bruegel was also a painter, and it shows him um, in uh, a composition with his wife and two of his children, his daughter uh, and his son. And Rubens has achieved something quite, I think, extraordinary by being able to knit together these four figures in a beautifully sort of harmonious uh, way. This is sort of the prototype of the modern nuclear family speaking <laughs> to us across 400 years. The husband has his arm over his wife's shoulder. The, the wife has got her arm over her son's shoulder. 
the daughter is looking up at um, her mother in sort of emulation and love, and the whole composition comes together in this beautiful knot of hands in the mother's lap. It's really wonderful. It's interesting that there are no references to Jan Brugel's profession. He and his family are dressed as wealthy, prosperous Antwerp uh, merchants. The little boy looks almost like a sort of cavalier in a sense. Um, we know that uh, Bruegel and Rubens were close friends. Rubens helped Bruegel with some of his correspondence, writing in Italian to his patron in Milan. And they also collaborated on pictures, worked together on single paintings. So I like the idea of, uh, of, of, of Bruegel sort of looking over Rubens' shoulder as he was working on this, and perhaps <laughs> Rubens saying, no, look, look, Jan, I'm not finished yet. You can't <laughs> see it yet. And so, I mean, it's a really sort of touching and, uh, and wonderful and incredibly sort of modern painting. Indeed, it's, it's, there's so much affection in the eyes of Bruegel, aren't there? Looking at us, but of course looking at Rubens. That's right, that's right. And um, Rubens was also a great admirer of Jan Bruegel's father, of Peter Bruegel the Elder's work, and uh, collected his work, including a, a landscape with the rest on the flight into Egypt, which is in our collection. Um, and again, I think it was a nice idea that the two of them sort of, you know, taking a break perhaps from posing for this work would have drifted over to look at uh, Rubens's collection of Peter Bruegel's uh, paintings. How nice. Um, and next to this is a landscape. And of course, one of the things that's astonishing about Rubens is that, as you say, you know, he's helping out Bruegel with his Italian. He's being a diplomat between Spain and, and England. But at the end of his life, he settles down and paints beautiful landscapes like the one that we're looking at now. Yes, this amazing sort of protean figure who can turn his hand to anything, portraits and great sort of... Uh, altarpieces, and then this is again a very different sort of uh, dimension of his work. And as you said, this is Rubens towards the end of his life. He's bought the Chateau of Edstein outside Antwerp. He's very wealthy. He's recognized as the prince of painters across Europe. Um, he's married Helena Fourmont, his, his young second wife, and life is good for Rubens. And he sets about painting this extraordinary group of wonderfully sort of lyrical landscapes for his own enjoyment and pleasure. They're free, they're open, the brushstroke is incredibly sort of provisional in some areas, and you can just see an artist delighting in the act of painting. It's this sort of, the, the constellation he describes here, it's almost like he's got his paintbrush and just flicked it at the surface of the, of the, of the work. It's exactly that. It's so sort of provisional. The, you can see the, the ground layer through the blue of the night sky. It's very open, and then the stars are literally in this sort of creative act, sort of flicked onto the canvas, onto the panel rather. In some cases, sort of it looks like they're actually over the branches uh, of the tree and then the way that the moonlight reflects so sort of beautifully in the, uh, in the, the little stream that sort of meanders through the composition. And it, it relates to the next gallery that we're going to look at because it was owned by Joshua Reynolds. That's right. Painter. So owned by Joshua Reynolds, who um, for us there is another connection there that uh, Reynolds was the first president of the Royal Academy. Our building was built for the Royal Academy. This room in which we're standing now seems to have been the place where Reynolds was laid in state after he died. And Reynolds cherished this picture. Um, for him, it becomes an example of how to successfully paint a, a nocturne. But in fact, it wasn't just Reynolds. Constable also knew it, had prints of it at the foot of his bed. And it becomes a really influential picture for the development of a native English uh, landscape painting school. Let's go and look at those Reynolds now. So we're just going to briefly look at this Reynolds because it seems to me to relate directly to the picture that we've just been talking about. I think you're right there. This is a, a, a large canvas um, depicting Cupid and Psyche, which Reynolds painted as uh, an exhibit for the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, which means that in 1789 it was actually first unveiled in, uh, in the Courtauld spaces uh, on the top floor, and it's Cupid and Psyche, 
Cupid is asleep on a bed, uh, having made love to Psyche. She is holding up a candle and has discovered his identity, uh, which was forbidden. He is about to wake up because a drop of hot wax falls onto his body and she is sort of banished as a result. In the top right-hand corner, there is an open, uh, let's call it a window, with a view to the night sky and the moon. And one imagines that, as Reynolds was working on this painting, that he might have had reference to the Rubens landscape by moonlight, which for him was sort of an exemplary picture of uh, nighttime effects. Let's go upstairs and look at this extraordinary new grand gallery. Now, we're in the great room, and it's difficult to choose one work to talk about in here because it's just, I, I feel like we're just surrounded by masterpieces. It's that you've mentioned earlier on that people come here for the Impressionist paintings and the post-Impressionist, and, 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 and what you have here is just this extraordinary vista of wonderful works. Oh, it's kind of you to, uh, to, to put it like that. It's, um, yes, pretty head-spinning, I think. Uh, 38 of Samuel Courtauld's very greatest uh, Impressionist installed in this extraordinary space. I and mean, we, we really hope that this will become, you know, a, an absolute sort of must-see destination for anyone coming to the UK. So this room, I remember the last few years that I've been coming to the Courtauld that this was divided up. Um, when was the last time that it was this grand space? Yes, I'm impressed you remember it at all because I think lots of people will have passed through the Great Room actually without being aware of it at all. It was divided up into four smaller galleries. Some of those galleries had little ceilings on them, so there was no sense of the sort of grandeur and historical importance of this uh, really magnificent triple height space. Uh, it was subdivided in 2002, so for the best part of 20 years, um, no one's experienced it like this. And it is one of the, the great sort of spaces of, uh, of London, built in 1780 by William Chambers for the Royal Academy to host their annual summer exhibitions. And now uh, this combination of this wonderful soaring gallery with these absolutely extraordinary 19th century pictures I think is something really powerful. You've really thought about the the different viewpoints as you come through the space haven't you so for instance the great Manet at the Folie Bergère is not immediately visible but you you turn a corner and bam there she is. That's right there was um there was a moment where we were thinking whether the room should be just completely open and completely sort of bare of any sort of insertions. And we felt actually that would not be a very satisfactory visitor experience, the sense that you walk into a gallery and at the turn of the head you see absolutely everything. I mean, maybe for a moment that's incredibly exciting, but then I think uh, not very rewarding. So we have two freestanding walls in the gallery which are demountable, but which give a very dynamic character to the space and allows you to move through and around and, as you say, to discover things at every turn. I think, crucially, we didn't want the, the Manet to be visible when you walked across the threshold. So the first thing you see is the two great Gauguin Tahitian paintings, and then once you approach those, then coming into view on the left-hand side is, uh, is that extraordinary Manet, and then spinning around as you walk towards her, the Van Gogh self-portrait, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm struck by this idea that this collection could be built, and yet every single work in this display seems to hold you, in the sense that, you know, you'd think that if you had a certain number of masterpieces, they would attract all the attention, but actually you just keep coming back and every work is just grabbing you as you walk around the room. It's amazing that. There, there really isn't a, uh, you know, a bad picture in this gallery and we haven't even mentioned the sort of sequence of mm. seven or eight Cezannes behind me here, which include uh, the man with the pipe and the card players and Montaigne Saint-Victoire and the plaster cast Cupid. And so it's... Um, I think people will just be thrilled to discover these pictures. And previously, before we closed, they hung on the second floor 
uh, on chains with individual picture lights as their source of illumination. It was very oppressive and sort of outmoded and it characterized them and you know, they felt like sort of old master paintings in a country house in a sense. And I think they feel completely liberated now and they have some of their sort of radical quality back. So even for me, I've known these pictures for a long time, there's a sense of sort of rediscovery and I'm seeing the Manet and the Cezannes in a completely new light. Indeed. I wanted to ask you about, you know, what, what's the intention now for the Courtauld? You know, where do we go from here, if you mm. like? So people in London who know this collection, love this collection, revisit it time and again. Is the idea to make, as you hinted at before, the, the Courtauld a kind of destination so people will come here independently? It's not, in a way, it's not the sort of in-the-know gallery anymore. Yes, that's absolutely what I hope for, that it isn't just for, for those in the know, for art aficionados, but you know, this is a collection that was set up by Samuel Courtauld with a very particular sort of mission in mind. It was based on his belief that art is life-enhancing, that it's not just a nice thing to have, but that it is essential for the well-being of the individual and the health of society as a whole. And that is the mission that we are committed to. That's why during our closure period, many of these pictures were shown across the UK in our partner institutions, in museums and towns and cities where the, same, the, the Courtauld's business used to have a major textile manufacturing presence. And so Renoir's La Loge and the Monet and Modigliani and Cezanne's, they, they went to Coventry and Preston and Hull and Belfast and elsewhere and that was immensely rewarding and so I really hope that this comes to be seen as a resource for the nation really. It's also a resource for people who are learning and thinking about art isn't it? Yes. And people who are doing that as students but yes. also visitors as you say and young people and I think we're going to go and see a work now by Cecily Brown and it seems to me that this is a, this is a really instructive idea mm. that you have a living artist at the heart of the court so let's go and have a look at that now. Now, I'd walked up this staircase at the Courtauld numerous times, but never realised that there was a great big gap for a picture at the top of it. Tell us about this. A gap quickly gets filled in, uh, in any art gallery, but here it's particularly purposeful. So at the very top of the famous Royal Academy spiral staircase, there is a large and previously empty frame. We know that when the Royal Academy opened here in 1780, that there was originally a painting there by uh, an academician who you'd be forgiven for not knowing called Giovanni Battista Cipriani. That painting is long since lost, um, but this wall was just crying out for something really exciting. This is the first time that a work of art returns to this location in over 200 years. It's an extraordinary location, a wide sort of horizontal frame on a curved wall. It's well over four meters wide and it just grabs you as you come up the stairs and arrive at the top on the landing where behind you, you have the early Impressionist pictures. In a way, you couldn't have chosen a more fitting artist because Cecily Brown is a painter who draws on the art of the past constantly in her work, right? That's right. She's an artist who loves the Courtauld collection and knows it well, not just the 19th century pictures, which are clearly a sort of touchstone, but also the earlier collections and coming out of Rubens. And this picture, which sort of slides between figuration and abstraction in this extraordinary way that is a signature sort of aspect of uh, Cecily Brown's work, I think, invites you to think about that long tradition of painting uh, and the act of painting as well. And indeed, there's a, there's a palette with a thumb through it on the far left of this piece. It's actually sort of a triptych, is it? Or, or a single piece made up of three canvases that bend round the wall, effectively. Yes, that's right. That it, it is made of three individual parts that you can sort of scan across uh, harmoniously. I think people will just love standing here at the sort of balustrade, this sort of uh, Titanic-like spot at the top <laughs> on the bow of the ship and sort of contemplating this picture which has two male nudes at the heart of it but then surrounded by this sort of extraordinary dreamscape, this maelstrom of sort of brushwork out of which emerge sort of individual figures and details and faces and other sort of elements. 
and some of them, I think, uh, refer in a gentle way to pictures in our collection or to traditions uh, which our collection also addresses. That's right. I mean, it, you could, to a certain extent, try and unpick what the references might be. But I, I think, in a way, the, the strongest thing about this is that you can come out of having seen gallery after gallery of great art and, and know that art is still being made and it nods to that history. Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. I think that it sort of, it, it, yeah, it, it asks a question. It, it sort of refreshes your eyes as you come out of Rubens and the Baroque and it sort of invites you to think about sort of the long tradition of painting rather than just sort of picking out individual uh, episodes. And I hope that that really sort of provokes people to just a pause in a sense and to think about those questions of representation and figuration and how that addresses not just the art of today, but you know, is that an interesting lens through which to think about the great 19th century painters and what they were doing? And you know, even aspects of Rubens, the way that she foregrounds the materiality of paint and the act of painting, you could look at that and then go downstairs and look at a Rubens oil sketch and actually think, hey, that's, you know, there's a connection there. Ernst, thank you so much for taking us around the gallery. Thank you for, uh, for coming to pay us a visit. The Corso Gallery is open now. Now it's time for Work of the Week. The tour of the portraits of Barack and Michelle Obama by Kahinda Wiley and Amy Sherrill travelling the US has now reached the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, or LACMA. Accompanying it is an exhibition, Black American Portraits, which features images of black people mostly drawn from LACMA's own collection. The curators of that show are Christine Y. Kim and Liz Andrews, and Christine has selected one work from the show to discuss, Bagman by Samela Lewis. Christine, uh, we're talking about a work by Samela Lewis. Why did you choose to talk about this as a kind of emblem of the show? Samela Lewis is an extraordinary, important artist in Los Angeles, and even more specifically at LACMA. It's recorded that she was born in 1924 in New Orleans, but actually her memory and other records, more specific records, because of course at the time, as happens in many places around the world with recording birth and death dates, accuracy for certain individuals and populations is not always there. She was actually born in 1923, making her 98 years old, not just 97 today. Um, she still lives in Los Angeles and actually not so far from the, the, the museum. She's really an extraordinary figure in art history and has contributed two works to the exhibition. Warren Kenner, a portrait of her friend that she made when she was 16 years old from 1948, and Bagman from 1996, which is the painting that I'll be talking about today. Um, but a couple of things, a few kind of contours to just sort of outline her biography a bit for those of you who aren't familiar with, with her and her work. Um, she was mentored by Elizabeth Catlett, who actually had studied under James Porter um, at Howard University and wrote the first comprehensive book on African-American art in 1943. And Samela Lewis really was a pioneer in the field of art history and has produced an impressive body of work while also creating opportunities for others, artists of color. And, you know, has also been an extraordinary mentor, educator, um, and done so many things in the field. She is a co-founder of the California African American Art Museum here in L.A., also the Museum for African Art, along with many other galleries in the area. She showed an early interest in art as, as a child, and she attended Diller University, which is where um, she met Elizabeth Catlett. And she was part of the cohort of students that Elizabeth Catlett famously convinced the New Orleans Museum of Art to allow into see the Picasso show. Of course, at the time, black students weren't allowed to go into the museums, and that was the first experience that Samela Lewis had in a museum and of course was very astounded by what she learned and saw there. And after graduating from Dillard, she worked at two historically black colleges and universities, Morgan State and Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, or FAMU. Um, she came to Los Angeles after becoming the first black woman to receive a PhD in art history from Ohio State in 1960. And actually her dissertation focused on Chinese art, which 
was part of Lewis's expansive understanding around non-Western aesthetics, object making, as well as a sort of world view. She collaborated with Ruth Waddy and E.J. Montgomery here in Los Angeles um, to publish a series, a very important series called Black Artists on Art from 1969. A lot of the work uh, that Kelly Jones and Bridget Cooks and other art historians have done has been around um, these periods in Los Angeles and relationships between artists, the work that they were making in institutions in the 1960s and 1970s. And um, she famously gave a lecture at LACMA in 1969 entitled The Relationship of the Black Artist in Our Society, which broke museum attendance records. And if we go back to today, contains a number of the elements um, that we're thinking about today. I mean, when I think about this, I also think about um, some of the reading that I've gone back to in organizing Black American portraits, an article that I can cite is Okwe and Weezor's 2004 essay, Art Production in a Time of Crisis. And in it, he sort of gets to the ways in which artists' collectives, um, conversations with writers, and really kind of in these communities, these creative and intellectual cultural communities, how kind of so much material was produced, many of it just in thought and moving the kind of conversation forward, and in many other cases, actual making which again, back to, to Los Angeles history, we saw here in the 60s and 70s, David Hammond, Senga Ngudi, and, and a number of other artists, also poets and writers, um, really making creative work at the time. Lewis created a number of groundbreaking projects that involved um, providing platforms for artists of color, black artists in particular, to have spaces to show their work, as I mentioned earlier, the spaces that she co-founded. But even more specifically, at LACMA, she was really responsible for diversifying the educational programs. Her archives are at Scripp College in Claremont, where she taught as well. And the painting that I want to focus on, Bagman, is from 1996, but it was actually a second version of a Bagman painting that she had made in the 1970s that had ended up in a private collection and it was difficult to loan, so she just decided to create her own. If you look at this painting, it's a vertical portrait of a single figure related to her memories of the garbage collectors in New Orleans when, when she was young. And it's almost this totemic figure that very much reminds me of African forms, of Asian and Chinese forms in this kind of totemic sort of blocks of color. So with the exception of the brown skin of the figure, she only uses primary colors of yellow, red, and blue. Um, the figure himself stares directly at the viewer with a gaze where he's almost squinting his eyes, where he's suspicious, why are you looking at me? I'm looking right back at you um, as he's moving on with his sacks or slung over his shoulder. And you almost can feel, even though it feels like a very kind of flat and static image, that he's kind of on his way and you're on your way, but you make this sort of eye contact with the figure. And it's really quite an intense painting. Indeed it is. I'm looking at it now and it's just got this, as you say, that directness of gaze. It's a sort of defiance, but you can feel the empathy of Samela, can't you? You can feel her reaching out to this, this human that she's encountering. Absolutely. And it's so interesting because in Los Angeles, perhaps more than other places in the country and the world, she is someone who's really recognized here as a sort of a godmother or a grandmother to, to black figuration. And she also worked abstractly and she, I was at her home a few weeks ago and she's continuing to paint and draw on these prints. Um, that was a collaboration with Maya Angelou. But I think also kind of thinking about the ideas in the show in black American portraits, where in the middle of the, of the summer of 2020, um, I had been already working on this exhibition with Liz Andrews, combing through the collection really s from the moment we knew that the Obama portraits were coming to LACMA as the only West Coast venue. For me, it was really important to think about how can these portraits be something beyond themselves? They're extraordinary portraits by Kahinde Wiley and Amy Sherrill, respectively, of former President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. And the symbolism, the color, the gaze, the, the position, uh, the pose of the figures make these paintings extraordinary for a number of reasons, in addition to the first black president and first lady choosing two black contemporary artists to portray them. But in, in combing through the collection, the idea for the show, even though I had, you know, as curators often do, multiple checklists, possibilities, curatorial premises, you know, being fleshed out, 
uh, you know, going back to different resources, connecting with past exhibitions, so on and so forth. But by summer, um, actually, after reading an article in The New Yorker by Elizabeth Alexander called The Trayvon Generation and thinking about an entire generation of young people during a pandemic whose uh, communication with experience of, you know, news, of friendship, of classrooms, of everything is really happening on their mobile devices, you know, sort of what happens in scrolling through and the uh, Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck you know, all of this footage out there that we know is so important, uh, bystander footage, in terms of allowing people to see what some people experience on a daily level, the moment they leave their house, or even they might still even be in bed. But at the same time, there is this sort of, you know, fetishization and spectacle of black pain and trauma. And how do we as an institution understand that and, and think about that? You know, what what can we do, of course, you know, far beyond posting, you know, solidarity statements and, and these sort of, you know, virtue signaling gestures or the, this sort of performance, which, you know, in some ways can be very heartfelt. In other ways, just seems like the sort of the right thing to do in the moment. And for me, you know, Black American Portraits is primarily based on the permanent collection. And it is not a comprehensive survey of African American portraiture. So I just want to sort of put that out there. It would take dozens of museums simultaneously, you know, with, with years of research, I think, to really do, do that properly. But in a very short period of time, we have acquired dozens of artworks. And I think that's where um, going back to patrons, to, to trustees, to form patrons, to artists, to their galleries, to collectors that we may not know personally, but who have collected their work and want to support them, and sort of galvanizing all of these conversations and relationships and seeing where some of the major holes are. And Samela Lewis is, is an artist whose work we really need to commit to. And, and LACMA really, you know, um, given her relationship to the museum that we're trying to bring into the collection. And so, um, so I think that this work really speaks to not only LACMA's history and kind of the thinking in this moment with this exhibition, but also the fact that um, in a sort of contextualized way, we do have David Hammond's body print. We do have other works in the, in the collection that are really about talking directly about brutality, violence, voting rights, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, really important topics, but it seemed really like more of a moment while talking about those things, but to center black joy, exuberance, complexity, subjectivity, nuance, abundance, family, community. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I mean, you see where Bagman kind of fits into this. I mean, this in intense figure, this artist with a, an extraordinary history, the Bagman that looks right at you and all of that space, both, you know, in between, which can be vast, but also can be very, very, very upfront, you know, and close and personal. And so thinking about all of these layers that we're addressing in the show, um, so many of those words can be applied to this painting and can speak to you know other artists and other aspects of the exhibition. And curiously, the, sh the show is um, hung salon style in the Resnick Pavilion. And the youngest artist in the show, Chase Hall, from the moment he walked in the show with you know with no guidance or direction really on his own, sort of planted himself in front of this this painting by the oldest living artist in the exhibition and just stared at it and asked you know, a million and one questions about it. Um, and I thought that was particularly poignant. I wanted to ask you a bit about, because you, there was a historic show of black portraiture at LACMA and, and you you sort of refer back to that, yes. right, in, in, in this exhibition. Can you tell me, to what extent have you contextualised that? To what extent have you attempted to reinvestigate some of the works in that show, for instance? How, how much of it, um, of the current show, refers directly to that previous exhibition? Subtly, not so subtly, Two Centuries of Black American Art was the title of David Driscoll's show in 1976. And our exhibition is called Black American Portraits. Um, David Driscoll is represented in the show with a portrait called The Jazz Singer from 1978. Um, it is an extraordinary work. But the, the legacy at LACMA around David Driscoll's show is really quite extraordinary. Um, and I'll try to maybe tell you a little bit about those, those kind of contours in a, in a nutshell. In October of 1968, 
there was an exhibition of African art objects from the Tishman collection that we put on view. And um, that fall, the museum asked um, some black employees who were the security guards um, if they would help or collaborate and bring people in from, from the African-American community into the exhibition. And that's when um, the Black Arts Council, BAC, started being formed by Cecil Ferguson and, and Claude Booker. And so in December, December 28th of 1968, is when a program happened. And it happened at night, I think it was after 8 or 9 o'clock, as opposed to your typical 5 to 7, 6 to 8 opening. And this was a time when, when people were off work for them. There were performers on stilts, there were jazz performers, there was this idea that within the space of the museum, there can be a type of cultural specificity in everything from programming, entertainment, food, you know, list of invited guests, etc., cetera, um, could be really rethought and bring people in in, in a very abundant and, and open way. And I think that that really kind of triggered some deeper thinking um, and Black Culture Festival, you know, a number of events, the lecture that I cited earlier by Samala Lewis, happened that next year. She came into the museum as an employee and it was actually Samela Lewis who encouraged the museum to bring in a black guest curator, David Driscoll, to curate a major exhibition, which he did in 1976. There are a few other exhibitions that happened at LACMA in the 1970s. And in 1981, um, there was a solo show of work by Marin Hassinger, which was unfortunately in the basement galleries. But LACMA went quite some time without having a Black-centered exhibition. Um, in fact, 30 years until 2011. And in 2011, from that point forward, there was a sort of explosion of exhibitions. 2010 is the year that I arrived at LACMA along with Franklin Sermons, who's now the director at PAM. Eileen Fort had been there in the American Art Department. And so at that moment, we saw shows of Archibald Motley, Noah Purifoy, uh, Betty Saar, curated by um, Carol Eliel in the Modern Art Department. Um, I did Julie Maratou and Isaac Julian. And there were a number of exhibitions that came in, but there was really quite a, a long gap there. And in addition to doing these exhibitions, um, I have felt that it's really important to invest in the artists and the works themselves to bring the work into the collection um, and not just to put these these objects on display. It's really curious, isn't it, that you're talking about this really progressive moment that, so, as you say, Samela was directly involved with. There's a show curated by a guest curator and then there's this gap. It's symptomatic of, of the art world in that time that, that that was seen to be enough or that the nettle wasn't grasped at the time by the people running the museum. And I think this is really important to, to me, is that this is a moment where we can really start being honest in ways that we weren't before. Of course, there have always been layers of honesty and sincerity and authenticity. Um, and in many ways, perhaps it's, it's a larger, more historic national problem around kind of coming to terms with, with histories and pasts and annihilations and massacres and et cetera, et cetera. But I think that if we can start with an honesty of our past and put the shortcomings sort of, you know, on the front burner, not to remain there forever, but to show the gaps and then to, you, you know, to, to acknowledge them and to also use this as a moment. I mean, all in terms of exhibitions, acquisitions, public programming, board diversification, staff diversification, equity models that exist within fundraising, that exist within communications, the language we use, you know, so on and so forth, can come, you know, out of this type of deeper thinking and honesty and, and to say, yes, that happened here. Christine, that's a great way to end this conversation. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ben. Black American Portraits is at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art until the 17th of April 2022. And that's all for this episode. Do subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With. The new series begins next week. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Ernst, Ilaria and Christine. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. Bye for now. 
The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.